Okay, again, uh, I, I'd like to take this opportunity again to thank all of you for coming. I know it's diff traveling and all of these things are difficult these days, but I appreciate you coming and accepting the, to be with us and accepting the challenge to, to hopefully be provocative in all your talks. So what I thought I would do today is, is uh, you know, take a little bit of uh, time to revisit the amyloid hypothesis, both from concepts, experimental models, and therapies. Before I start, these are my disclaimers. Uh, I have ongoing collaboration with Abvi and Idorcia, and I'm also a founder and CSO of Indy Biosciences, which is a two and a half years old uh, biotech company spin-off from my lab. So this is what I was taught when I was in Jeff and then in le later in Peter's lab is that uh, you know, neurodegenerative diseases are all characterized by the presence of these different types of the aggregates in the affected brain. And we sort of grew up in the field uh, thinking that these protein aggregates are probably the formation of these, is the driver of many of these neurodegenerative diseases and that what constitute at the time what we know as the amyloid hypothesis. And I can't think of a more compelling reason to revisit the amyloid hypothesis than what we have discussed today, as that is the fact that today there are no method for diagnosing these diseases or monitoring their progression. We have no cures or disease-modifying strategies. And as we learned from all the talks, the mechanisms are just getting more and more complex. For my talk today, what I wanted to focus on is two aspects. One is why clinical trials are failing. And two, to what extent does a failure in clinical trial reflect the failure of the hypothesis itself, the original and the modified form of the hypothesis that I will share with you, and what we can do about this. So, over the years today, if you were to do a PubMed search, there is about 1,000 papers in amyloid and inhibitors published every year over the past six years. In the clinic, none of these amyloid inhibitors have passed or you know, have passed clinical trials. And we've given all the different reasons to this. You've heard some of them today. Some of them, before the PET tracers, they were given to the wrong patients, and also because of the lack of stratification, they're giving to the wrong patients. Wrong timing because of the lack of tools to diagnose people at early stage in the disease in the case of Parkinson today and late stages in dealing with people who already have loads of amyloids in the brain. There were also many that failed because the, they used the wrong drug that actually did not get to hit, engage the target in the brain or the wrong target. Nonetheless, this continued failure had led people to the question is, are we really working on the right hypothesis? Is amyloid formation or the role of protein aggregation the right hypothesis? And what I would like to start is to say there are many reasons for these failures. And I use this usually number 10, but today I'll put it as number one. And that is the reluctance or failures to embrace the complexity of the disease. We've heard today from all the teams that these diseases are not single entity disease. They're heterogeneous at the level of clinical symptoms. They're heterogeneous at the level of pathology. We know that many of these diseases are associated with multiple genetic risk factors that somehow seem to intersect in certain pathways. We've tried to target these diseases by dealing with them at one protein at a time, when in fact this is not the case. Every single protein we are trying to target exists as a combination of different forms that in the normal, but as well as in the pathogenic state, from differences in aggregation state to differences in structure and post-translational modif modifications. We've heard from Malou and others that there, you know, there are multiple mechanisms at play. Yet, when it comes to the bottom line of testing you know, therapies, we're still testing one therapy at a time. We start with anti-amyloid, it didn't work, we went to anti-tau. And unfortunately, I feel we're following the same path in Parkinson's disease, uh, although we're, we're listening. So we believe that you know, targeting one molecule, one pathway at a time is likely to be efficient. Another important reason that I believe has to do with the lack of understanding what the normal function of these proteins are. 
we've put so much emphasis in trying to block the pathology and not pausing to think at what cost. We're learning now from the clinical trials in Huntington disease and others that you know, lowering these protein levels may have detrimental effects. So we know, don't know in many of these trials to what extent these antibody engagements affects the normal function of the protein. And we believe that these two mechanisms of loss engagement function are both at play. The question is, what's the relative contribution of these mechanisms at different stages of the disease? But this is something we cannot lose sight of when we think about therapies. Another point that I would like to make is that over the years, there's been a growing gap between how we study protein aggregation in the lab and what actually protein pathologies and aggregate look like in the brain. And for a long time, this was okay because we did not have a choice. So most of us biochemists, biophysicists, we like to express protein in E. coli, do NMR, do studies, and make it proteins. In fact, pathological inclusions in the brain are not just made of proteins. They exist. This is work from Sarah, who will present tomorrow on a correlative light electron microscopy of Lewy bodies. And what you could say, there are complex mixtures of fibrils, protein, mitochondria, autophagosomes. And of course, the question is, is it possible to bridge this gap? And we can dis discuss that more in detail, but the answer to that is yes. This is work from our lab, where we can now, in a neuronal model based on seeding, reconstitute similar pathology, sort of Lewy body-like inclusions that resemble Lewy bodies at the biochemical and ultrastructural level. Let's dig deeper into this. We've, we've always, you know, in the field, learned of amyloid plaques as one name. Turns out that there are nine different types of amyloid plaques, and they're listed here. You know, there's cotton-like amyloid plaques, there is diffuse amyloid plaques, this. If you were to ask today the people who develop or use PET tracers, which form of these amyloids do your tracers recognize? They don't know. The fact is we don't know whether the tracers we use today capture the diversity of the pathology. And that diversity is not only at the level of, of amyloid plaques, but at the level of tau, alpha-synuclein, and all of these proteins. There is not a single pathological form. And we know now from work in Alzheimer's disease that Alzheimer's disease is not just about A beta 40 and 42. When APP is processed, you produce at least eight different types of APP that are the ratio of these proteins influence pathology formation and clinical heterogeneity as well. Yet in the labs, we tend to study one peptide at a time. So there's quite a lot of structural work and quite a lot of, when we try to probe toxicity, we sort of do not deal with monotypic interaction and, and do not account for this. This heterogeneity, I showed you what an image of a Lewy body looked like, but if you look at synuclein pathology in Parkinson's disease, this is what it looks like. And the question is, does this heterogeneity reflect distinct types of pathologies, or does it reflect an evolution of the same pathology? And the first one is likely the right answer. And the second most important thing, what does this morphological heterogeneity mean in terms of biochemical and structural properties of the protein? And we're just, if you look at the staging of Parkinson's disease, how it was done, it was done with a single antibody. The new refined staging system used two antibodies, all of which are targeting regions of the protein that gets cleaved in the Lewy bodies. So we don't have a complete picture of, of uh, this pathology. We have, what we have done recently in the lab for synuclein is we developed a panel of 37 antibodies that span the entire region and all the PKMs. And now we're beginning to see not only the diversity of pathology, but we're in this paper, which is now in preprint, you can read it, we identify synuclein pathology that is 100% composed of modified form of the protein for which the N-terminal and C-terminal part of the protein are not there. It starts at residue 30 to 103. You may say, you know, and this is now because we can map synuclein species at a cell type, in a cell type specific manner. Why is that relevant? It's relevant because all the antibodies in immunotherapy target these regions. The great majority of antibodies that are in clinical trials today 
target mainly the C-terminal part of antibody of synuclein, and one was the N-terminal. These are the regions that predominantly get cleaved and removed in, in, uh, during pathology. Uh, Brad Hyman, I'm sure he will talk about this, did a recently published a beautiful paper in which they isolated cortices from Alzheimer patients. It was about 32. And then they mapped the biochemical signature of these in terms of post-translational modification and size distribution based on size exclusion chromatography, and then put them through an array of seeding-based assays in vitro and vivo. And what they were able to, sh to show is that there is some correlation between the clinical heterogeneity of the disease and the biochemical and structural profile of the different aggregated form uh, of tau. And that's uh, the other thing that is important from this study. If you see, typically when we conduct studies in the lab, we use five to six patients. And here in this 32, you can see they have very different profile. If you use the right different type, you know, six different group of six patients, you would have get a different answer. So the idea is that you need to basically uh, expand the number of uh, human samples that we use. Now, another complicating factor that we've learned over the years, uh, the last couple of years, thanks to advancement in cryo-electron microscopy, is that the structure of the fibrils we see, we study in the lab, is very distinct from that which occurs in the human brain. Now, it's too early. We know this is for tau because tau people have used heparin to induce aggregation, and none of the heparin aggregates resemble any of the tau pathologies from AD or other tauopathies. This is a structure of synuclein fibrils from MSA, and these are all the different structures that have been solved for synuclein recombinant protein, and you can see they're very structurally distinct. Yet a lot of the assays we used in the past to develop drugs or to screen for antibodies relied heavily on the use of, re, of, re, of, uh, of re, recombinant proteins. And, and the other feature is most recombinant proteins do not have these post-translational modifications which exist in the brain. So it's not surprising you know, to some extent you know, why, why, why some of these things fail. And again, here I want to show that bridging that complexity is possible. Shown here, this is a, it's a electron microscopy of uh, tau fibrils produced by uh, addition of heparin, and you can see they're completely distinct from fibrils that are uh, derived from Alzheimer's disease brain. But what I can show you here using a new templated mechanism, we can actually induce similar type of structure in the test tube to those that one can isolate from the human brain. Of course, the third most important reason is that at the animal trials, the animal models the right animal models do not exist. We don't have an animal model of Alzheimer's disease. We don't have an animal model of Parkinson's disease. All the existing animal models simply reproduce very specific aspects of the disease. And if there is a need to develop better models. Most importantly, there is a need to use and test drugs in multiple models before they go on to clinical trials. But what I would argue for is there is a more urgent need to abandon bad models. You know, I've seen the companies use models just because they made them. So at the end, if you look at this, what we have learned, you have diseases that are have caused by multiple triggers and causes, and we'll hear about viruses and bacterial infection and this. There are multiple disease subtypes. There are different multiple types of pathologies, multiple underlying mechanisms, and there are multiple targets or co-pathologies in these diseases, and yet we expect to treat this with a single monotherapy. So, uh, th therefore, I agree with the concept that the, the future is in combination personalized treatment, but also all drug development should embrace the use of multiple uh, uh, models. Most importantly is it's nice to learn about all of these complexities, but unless we integrate those into our experimental diagnostic and therapeutic approaches, there's going to be little progress. So the question has always here. The question has always been, is whether amyloid is the cause of the consequences, and and there is a correlation between the level of pathology and disease development. There are a lot of data showing that, for example, low pathology correlates with different types of clinical symptoms of Parkinson's disease. 
But it's also true that there are cases that Lewy body, for example, an amyloid is found in healthy individuals, that Lewy body is absent in specific cases. In 30% of LARC2 patients, there are no Lewy body pathology. And that removal of these aggregates, as we know from the antibodies, is not sufficient to, to prevent disease progression. And the question is, is that sufficient to say that aggregation is not important? And my answer to that question is not. It simply means there are maybe multiple mechanisms at play. There is a concept of resilience. We know that the patient, Alzheimer patients who has her head, her head full of amyloid pathology was protected from Alzheimer's disease because she has a Christchurch mutation in APOE3, right? You have to also accept that there are subtypes of neurodegenerative diseases that are caused by mechanisms independent of aggregation. In other words, you know, there, there may be in the case of LARC2 patients, we know that there is no pathology in the brain, and we know there is no seeding activity in the CSF. So therefore, it must be, you know, there may be a type of disease that is not ca uh, caused by this. And uh, I would like to end with this in the fact that in order to understand the relationship between a process and a disease, you have to be able to monitor the entire process. And today, we don't have this. What we're able to detect is fibrils and some Lewy body structures. We're not sure if we can capture that heterogeneity. <laughs> and we have no tools at all to detect oligomer and oligomers. The presence of oligomers has been used and invoked to explain the lack of correlation between pathology and disease. But the fact is, there are no tools today to detect this. Last year, we had a screening of 17 antibodies that were reported to be confirmational specific by companies. This was assembled by the Michael J. Fox. And after two years of exhaustive study, we found that not a single antibody is oligomer specific. All antibodies are non-specific or they recognize all different aggregated form. Yet antibodies are the basis of the foundation of the you know, knowledge foundation that we derive a lot of our hypotheses. And I would like to end here by just saying that it's very difficult to reconcile these, the, the discrepancy between pathology and disease, if we only think about aggregate as specific entities and not the aggregation process. You know, one way to explain this difference is, for example, is to say, how do we explain the presence of Lewy bodies in the absence of degeneration? Well, if Lewy bodies as fibrils form, and induce the formation of, you know, sort of dysfunctional organelles are protective, and they're able to sequester aggregates and functional organelles, then you can think of them as a protective mechanism, and therefore it's normal to see Lewy body pathology in, in, a, in a human brain. The other mechanism is basically that if for any reason this process of moving from aggregates that accumulates in the cell and cause organelle dysfunction to Lewy bodies is prevented somehow, then you could still have degeneration in the absence of Lewy bodies. And the third model or hypothesis is basically that the aggregation process triggers a cascade, pathogenic cascade, that is independent of the formation of the mature Lewy body and an amyloid plaque. And the concept here is that we need to start thinking about this as a process and not as a specific entities, whether it's oligomer or fibrils, and the day we're able to stop the entire process, which I believe the most effective way would be by stabilizing the native protein, is the ultimate test for the amyloid hypothesis. And I'll end here. Thank you. So we're right on time. Any other time for questions? Sheena? Here's one. That was beautiful and very clear, Hilal. And I wanted to come back to this ex vivo versus in vitro and what are we biophysicists, biochemists wasting our time doing when we're not looking at the right disease process or right mechanisms. So the fibrils that Shaw, Sherez et al. have purified from brains all are purified from a, with a very specific Pro, pro, protocol involving sarcosyl extraction, and their recent paper on saying, oh, I could see T-MEM106 fibrils when I look harder. 
So that's almost a single molecule experiment. So we're sort of ha having a sort of feel in, in the field that you have a specific amyloid subtype or fibril structure with different disease types. But I raise the question, is that actually true? Or are we just looking at the, the um, identities that we can purify and solve the structures of? So what clearly what we need is better in situ imaging so we can phenotype or have chemical probes that can detect the array of fibril architectures. So we're talking about complexity. And then, so could you comment on that? And then my second question, which goes along the same, of course, and David mentioned this. Of course, what we see in cryo-M is, is the stable fibril core. You don't see these very large and dynamic appendages that could be very different and contribute. And I think we need probes that pick that up. So could you talk about what I call hairy ends yes. so and, I, and, I mean, and Sarkisil? I address this. This is why I, in every example I showed that we can approach that complexity. So first, I think cryo-EM is a very biased technique. You know, what we see by cryo-EM is only the type of fibros that are helical and the type of fibros that are stable to survive all the procedures. So that is clear for me. It's, you know, what I was trying to say is that this, this gap in structure is not to say that we should stop doing structure. You know, what we should do is we should work toward, move towards that complexity. And then address the question whether there are types of amyloids in, in, in uh, types in the brain that indeed resemble what we form in vitro. But I would not use the argument that because the fibrils in the brain are not stable, because we're biased toward helical fibrils, I would just continue to business as usual, not taking that complexity into this. I think the most important thing also is that cryo-EM to me is, is, is one piece of the puzzle. It's not going to answer because what dictates the final structure is not only the sequence in the core, but the flanking sequences. And those flanking sequences are heavily modified. They're all the protein. And, you know, that's where most of the genetic mutations. So what we need is in vitro systems that allows us to reconstitute the core structure of what we see in the brain that we can then use to ask those specific questions of how mutations and PTM influence this. I think what we need to do in the, in the biophysics field is move toward trying to generate such systems. Well, we're lacking probes, I think, so yeah. you could go and... So uh, I can tell you we have done this for TDP43, and the paper is under review. We can form TDP43 full-length filaments that have the same core structure as what's isolated from the brain. And now we can go and ask things that cryo-EM cannot tell us. So I think the core is, is fantastic for things like what David is doing, probing the ends of the structure. But a lot of things are happening on the surface, and they interact on all these filaments. So. Um, yeah, no, I think you did a great job at uh, <clears throat> showing all the pros and cons of the amyloid hypothesis in a very convincing way. And I think more and more people are really opening their eyes uh, toward looking at a different direction just than, than aggregation. But, I mean, one of the statements that really caught my attention on, on your talk was, I mean, I, I think you said a lot of things that we do not have. But, um, I mean, in terms of biomarkers for the disease, I think that's where we've done the most progress. I think if, if something has been done right, is in the biomarkers field, I certainly for synuclein, maybe we don't have something yet, but um, at least for Alzheimer's disease, I think that there has been tremendous progress. I, I don't know if you agree with that or, uh, I mean, I or mean, what are the things you, th you, you think we have done that at least are in the direction of taking us toward developing real therapeutics for the disease? No, I think, you know, the CSF biomarkers, the tau, the imaging, but I think we, we, we need to pause and ask the question. I ask the people who developed the PET tracers, do you know if they captured this heterogeneity? And the answer was no. Yeah, but so, I mean, for I mean, example, with the tau tracers, we know that they don't bind to the tau of, I don't know, other, other tauopathies, but they do, I mean, like PSP or CBD or whatever, but they do bind. And then there are other types of ligands that do bind to, to other forms of tau. I think that there is some specificity. There is specificity for one amyloid versus another, but do they capture the heterogeneity of pathology 
associated with each type of proteinopathy. I, am, I have not seen the data. Again, I'm, not, I'm just being provocative to highlight the gaps that I, th I believe. Because if we don't see the whole thing, then how do we know we've prevented it? Right? If we don't have probes against other aggregates beside the product, how do we know that these aggregates don't exist? Over here. Thanks for a beautiful talk. I have one question about a comment you made about the recombinant proteins. And this has been something as an immunologist we are struggling with because how these proteins are made in the field and the way that recombinant proteins made and the LPS definitely it's uh, entice and activates a lot of immune pathways that a uh, natural protein doesn't. So we've been able to extract some tau, but can you comment what does the field do? Because when we went back and looked at all the way that they, everybody uses recombinant protein, it's very alerting for us. I think for, for, for a long time we had no choice. Okay? So now you know, there are two levels of complexity. There is structure and there is biochemistry. So the biochemistry comes from the presence of post-translational modifications. To address this, what we have done in the lab for Tau, Sinuclean, and Huntington is developed synthetic approaches where we build these proteins one amino acid at a time so we can reconstitute this. We have, we have produced a library of 46 different forms of Sinuclean, so that can be done. From the structural, I think we will be able. I said we've done this for TDP43. I am aware of work where now you can use CSF of a patient to reproduce the same structure in the brain. So I think we're, we're, we're also appro we're, we'll be able to approach that complexity. There are a lot of fundamental questions that we cannot just answer from material in the brain. So we have to find, develop systems that allows us to get to there and then use this. And I think for one for TTP43, we have one, and there is going to be some work published soon where it's going to be to show that indeed you can reconstitute the structure of something similar in the, in the test tube, and then those would be probably better tools than just recombinant. Yeah, so, so going back to biomarkers, that, uh, Virginia, can you wait just a second to use the mic? Is there people online? Oh, thank you. So, so, um, so Eli Elise said that uh, you know, and in AD we do have biomarker assay, and I think that I want to just emphasize that Elise, and I think that Alzheimer's is a unique case in the sense that we think that why we can detect beta amyloid and also tau is because there's so much crap in the brain, so they are not really degraded. But if you look at any of the other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, ALS, FTD, you cannot and you measure nothing in the CS7 in the plasma. Maybe plasma, I don't know. But it really it's not attractable. We need biomarkers, that's what I'm trying to say. And there was another question about recombinant protein. So actually some of those experiments have been done in the sense of particularly for synuclein. And recently, I think Adriano did the experiment maybe, that you, you prepare, somebody pre isolated of a synuclein from human brain and then use that to, for amplification instead of recombinant protein, same results. So it seemed like that the post transgene modification of at least synuclein is not so important for the amplification to give you specificity. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But what you see is, for example, a lot of the antibodies that target pathological aggregate target regions that are heavily modified, both for tau and for synuclein. David. Hillel, you did a wonderful job in pointing out the complexity that many of us ignore. At the same time, uh, I don't think we should throw up our hands and, and uh, worry about and abandon the simple methods. Because in science, we advance by changing one thing at a time. And one truth is that single proteins uh, amyloid beta or tau, whatever, with a single mutation when introduced into experimental animals cause mimic of disease, which I think is a very powerful. I argument. mean, I, I would not by, and I, I stated it in my answer to Sheena, by any means suggesting that we should abandon what we do. 
I think we will need everything we've learned, all the tools we learned to do this. All I'm just trying to advocate for is whatever we do, we should make extra effort to approach that complexity. And the advances we have today in protein synthesis, in cryo-EM, and biophysics allow us to do this. I agree 100%. I just <coughs> wanted to uh, second Hilal. Uh, I spent about six, seven months actually reading papers on Parkinson's disease, trying to understand as a theoretical physicist, is there anything I can do uh, that, that actually will learn something new? And I found that the only thing that you can actually do is do some modeling with, at a structural level because there is no time-dependent data. And in physics, you need time-dependent data, including changing thermodynamics parameters if you can, pressure, temperature, and so forth, chemical potentials, try to resolve what is happening in time. And I couldn't find, and uh, I hope we see some talks here, experimental, that actually showed us some, something in time developing. But uh, let's see the next modeling talks that we'll hear tomorrow. Uh, but, but I couldn't find anything that actually makes sense to understand what's going on in time. And that's crucial for, for at least for theoretical physics, maybe for other things not, but. Yeah, I think that and also being able to capture the entire process is going to be crucial. And I think Rohit will talk about this series. We're seeing increased evidence suggesting the role of early events as phase separation and thing, and we still don't, again, we don't have the tools to detect those or to even. I think we have to move on. Uh, let's thank Halal.